Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a quick announcement the big thing we're all working toward right now is fall conference is November 13th we have a lineup of speakers that you just cannot believe how amazing they are. Kelly Turner, the author of Radical Remission, is our keynote speaker. Radical Remission is the first study, represents the first study ever done on terminal cancer patients and how they stay alive. Um, she identified 75 strategies that these cancer patients use, nine of which they all use. Yes, diet is one of them, but you got to find out about the other eight. So looking forward to her lecture. And uh, we also have Dr. Richard Avlin, author of The Great Prostate Hoax, uh, Robert Whitaker, author of Anatomy of an Epidemic about the psych drugs. Um, the meals are fabulous. The, the fellowship, I think, with practitioners of like mind and, um, and people who are grounded in keeping themselves healthy and informed consent decision making, that sort of thing. It is an amazing weekend. I can't wait myself. And um, so you want to book your airline ticket, get your ticket now. You know, the price goes up every month. So the sooner you buy your ticket, the less money it costs. All right. So talk about a couple of things today. Um, one is exercise and glucose metabolism. So here's the deal. Skeletal muscles are those that form the mechanical system that moves the limbs and other body parts. And these muscles, the size of the capillaries, change based on a lot of factors, including physical activity. Aerobic exercise in particular results in the growth of capillaries and muscle fibers. So why does this matter? According to a new study, exercise-induced increases in capillary density contribute to improvements in glucose metabolism. So how this was all figured out is researchers looked at 12 older men and women who had been sedentary and then began a six-month exercise program, aerobic exercise program, and then they went through two weeks of detraining, in other words, not so much exercise anymore. The training resulted in significant increases in maximal oxygen uptake, capillary density, increases of the conversion of glucose to glycogen, that's the storage form of glucose, increases in glucose transporter for expression, that's a big name for proteins that help get glucose into the cells. In just two weeks of detraining, however, the numbers returned to baseline, where the people started before they started exercising. So, the take home point here, is that exercise is good for controlling glucose and a whole lot of other things too, but when you stop doing it, the effect goes away, so you've got to start and keep at an exercise program. The authors concluded that aerobic exercise contributes to improve improvements in glucose metabolism, and what that translates to is it's a, it can be part of a strategy to prevent type 2 diabetes and also part of a strategy to treat it or reverse it. While not examined in this study, um, exercise has been proven to improve the health of people with other conditions, including some that increase the risk of becoming diabetic. For example, exercise burns fat and builds lean muscle mass. Muscle cells are more insulin sensitive than fat cells, and exercise helps to keep you lean, being overweight or obese, leading risk factors for becoming diabetic. Additionally, most diabetic patients die of coronary artery disease, and lots of studies have shown that exercise uh, reduces many markers like cholesterol and blood pressure associated with coronary artery disease. So it's powerful medicine, and speaking of which, I think if we could put exercise in a pill and just make honest claims about it, we'd have a billion dollar seller, and gosh, if only you could get these effects with a pill, but you can't. You actually do have to go to the gym, you have to go to yoga, you have to run, walk, bike, do something. So, um, and, and you have to be consistent and you have to do it forever. I mean, a lot of people go through periods of activity and, um, and I suppose that's better than nothing, but I think what they don't realize is that when you stop doing these things for six months or six weeks or whatever your cycle is, a lot of the benefits that you achieve go away and then you have to build yourself back up, etc. So starting is easy. We've all done that a million times. Sustaining is the hard part of the exercise. All right, the next thing has to do with cancer treatment. And um, I've talked about this for years. Many cancer patients, patients in general, aren't told the truth, you know, true risks and benefits about treatment. But cancer patients in particular are not really well informed about the efficacy rates and side effects of proposed treatment. And so, for example, a doctor may tell a patient, if you take this drug, it has been shown to extend your life by 50%. You think, oh my gosh, sign me up for that until you read the fine print and find out that somebody with your condition is expected to live for six months. So we're talking about three extra months of life. And then you look at the side effects and you say to yourself, many people say to themselves, boy, 
if I'd known it was going to be this miserable, I wouldn't have signed up for it. In fact, in uh, Gilbert Welch's book, uh, most recent book, Less Medicine, More Health, uh, one of the research studies he cites um, indicates that lung cancer patients who underwent aggressive chemotherapy to buy a little extra time in terms of, of life, a few extra weeks of life, almost universally said that they, they wouldn't do it, knowing what they know now. All right, so um, here's the problem though. Doctors don't like to tell patients that treatments aren't effective. They don't want to say, we really can't do anything for you. Um, there are a lot of reasons for it. One of them is that I think there's an expectation on behalf of everybody that the cancer patient's going to show up in the office. We're going to put together a battle plan for fighting this cancer. So uh, doctors feel compelled to do it. And they also don't like to admit that they can't do anything. It's sort of like they, they don't want to admit defeat. Well, cancer patients who do receive treatments decline for two reasons. One thing is the cancer can progress. The other thing, and I mentioned this earlier, the treatment can actually uh, cause symptoms that make their quality of life almost just non-existent. Um, some of the symptoms that are common are pain and nausea, fatigue, depression, sleep disturbances, and, um, and that sort of thing. And I think sometimes the doctors get so intent on treating the patient, on, on treating the cancer, they're not treating the patient anymore. And sometimes what's best for the patient is what we call palliative care. In other words, we can't do anything to help you live longer. There aren't any chemotherapy treatments or whatever. They're actually going to extend your life in a meaningful way. What we can do is pay attention to making you more comfortable, addressing things like pain and comfort, and allowing people to die on their own terms and with some dignity. And by the way, die at home, because patients almost universally say they don't want to die in a hospital. But doctors just like palliative care, and one of the reasons is it's a form of giving up. It's like, you know, I'm admitting failure and defeat. Well, palliative care is more respectful of the patient's wishes, and actually studies show that it improves quality of life, and it results in fewer trips to the emergency room, fewer days spent in the hospital, and a reduction in cost. And you know, I don't think that we should be worried about cost at end of life um, uh, with cancer patients, except to the extent that spending a whole lot of money that doesn't improve their quality of life or help them live longer really, truly is wasteful. Well, in one study, 151 patients who'd been diagnosed with metastatic non-small lung cancer were randomly assigned to either traditional care or some traditional care with early onset of palliative care. And an interesting thing happened. First of all, only 33% in the palliative care group agreed to aggressive treatment. 54% in the group that with, without the palliative care had the aggressive treatment. But what was interesting is the palliative care group with less treatment lived longer, an average of 11.6 um, months versus 8.9 months for the traditional care group. So two major points here that I think we should pay attention to. One is that when patients are asked what they want to do, they often don't want all those aggressive treatments. And when patients get less care, sometimes they end up better off. Now, I have some um, reasons, or I, I, I think that I know why that is. One is that the, sometimes the treatments are so toxic that they actually end the patient's life sooner. So these patients who got less aggressive care actually ended up in a healthier state for the duration of their life. But another thing is that patients who are participating in their care and they feel like they get to make the decisions, they feel empowered, and outcomes for empowered patients, no matter what disease they're dealing with, are always better than outcomes for patients who are told what to do and follow directions and don't feel like they're participating in their care at all. Well, regardless of treatment choices, here's the reality. Some cancer patients are going to die. In fact, many of them are. And avoiding the reality doesn't change it. Honest discussion with the patients is important. And maybe doctors need more training in this area so that they can start to see end-of-life care and going about this in a different way, not as a sign of failure, but as a sign of compassion and um, doing what's best for the patient. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm very critical of doctors, and you guys who listen to me all the time know that, and so I don't want to give them a free pass on this, but the other side of it is I really do understand that um, doctors feel like i got to rise to the occasion and propose something. We have to do something. You know, doing nothing just seems so passive, but, you know, there is a time to just say, this isn't going to help, and I don't want to do it to you. And I, I have encountered a fair number of doctors who will do that, but unfortunately most of them won't. All right, that's all for today. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next on Thursday, actually, with more news.